Welcome to Mastering the Attention Economy podcast. I'm your host, Ari Lewis. Twice a week, we interview entrepreneurs, executives, and industry leaders on how to break through the noise and capture the audience's attention. Today's guest is Oliver Canton. Oliver is the owner of two successful online agencies within marketing and health coaching and has over 16,000 followers on Twitter. Thank you for having me, Ari. I'm excited. Yeah, so Oliver, you know, I got to know you through Twitter. Um, you know, it's it's been great interacting with you. And I was like, God, I have you on the podcast, you know, for, for guests, obviously, that probably aren't familiar with 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 some of your work. Can you can you talk about, you know, what, what you do for a living? Um, obviously, you know, you're not making money off Twitter. <laughs> Uh, absolutely. Um, the question is, did I slide in your DMs first or did you slide in my DMs first? I think it was me. Well, I, I think, I think for, the so. podcast, for the podcast, I asked you on. For sliding into the DMs, I'm not sure. I don't remember. I have to look. We'll, we'll see. Uh, but anyway, I'm, I'm happy to be on. I'm, I'm grateful to be part of this, this great show. And congratulations on starting to, to rank uh, higher and higher on the, on the Apple rankings. That's, that's exciting. I like that. Uh, back to your question. Um, so I am a marketer by trade and copywriting is the, the skill set that I deploy the most. And I earn my living two ways. I have a performance marketing agency where I partner with small and medium sized businesses, things like dental practices, hair restoration clinics. We're working with an NGO locally here in Canada right now, which is a very exciting mandate. And my other stream of income, I have a joint venture uh, coaching business in the health and fitness niche with a pretty large Twitter, uh, I don't like to say the word influencer, he's a scientist, but I have a large, uh, large influential scientist uh, as my partner in that venture. So, you know, you, your expertise is in copywriting. Um, you've, you've sort of grown this, uh, the, both businesses right now, you're, you're grossing over $100,000 per month um, total with, with both the businesses. You know, obviously copywriting is, is sort of crushed it on this front. What, what are some of the things that people need to know when they're, they're starting out marketing tips for, for engaging in great copywriting and, and, and capturing the attention? Of, of the target audience are looking for. Right. So, so that, that's a, that, that's a good and, and big question, right? So I, I think if you're not a marketer or if you're a marketer that hasn't really studied things like direct response or haven't studied the, the art of, of marketing in words, right? You would think that the web is a video medium and, and it is right. Right now we're doing an audio video show. Obviously podcasts are getting bigger. Uh, there's more minutes of video consumed than anything else. But the thing is, words drive video to a large degree, unless you're doing some exceptionally well-produced things where the visuals are, are the driver. Generally speaking, it's what you're talking about, right? So copywriting, the traditional definition would be salesmanship in print. So if you think back of the you know, the, the history of capitalism in the United States, uh, Benjamin Franklin could be considered one of the first copywriters. So that would be without going, you know, too far down the rabbit hole and um, promoting products, sometimes directly, sometimes indirectly in his various newspapers and writing. So Ben Franklin, amongst many things, was a copywriter. If you push a little bit later, something like the Sears catalog, um, Abercrombie and Fitch, I just learned recently also was a a direct to consumer mail business in the in the 60s and 70s. So of course pictures are important, targeting the right people are important, but copywriting, the words that you use to describe things, the way you describe them, and the most important thing is channeling the right emotions, right? Copywriting is not really about writing. It's about having a deep understanding of the emotions that move people that you want to move. Generally speaking, you can break that down into two buckets. You can say, am I removing a painful problem or am I fulfilling a key desire? So if you're not doing one of those two things, you're probably a commodity. And that's where you're competing on price. You're competing on uh, distribution, uh, maybe using big names or big brands. So copywriting allows the little guy to compete with the big guy if the research is done well and 
the the copy and the words are assembled uh, in a powerful way. And and I know I'm kind of babbling here, but I'll just add one thing about copywriting. It's everywhere. So the voice track on a movie trailer, that's copywriting. A political speech, that's copywriting. You could even argue political debates, the level of preparation that they do, the zingers they prepare, all of that, they work with, with speech writers and speech writers are in fact copywriters. So copywriting is at the center of communication online and offline. So, you know, before the conversation, we talked about some of your clients for your marketing agency and, and some, you know, a hair salon, I remember you mentioning, for example, how can smaller clients like that use copywriting to differentiate in, in attracting clients, especially for folks where it's really hard to tell the difference in, you know, is this, is this uh, company better than this other company? Right. Um, so what we were discussing, uh, it's a hair restoration uh, clinic. So like we're talking about like hair, hair plugs and, uh, and, and things of that nature. So you also hear often about storytelling, right? So story brand and, and things like that. So you're going to want to combine the principles of storytelling. Some things like Joseph Campbell's, you know, hero journey or, or things of that nature. There's different frameworks you can use. And then once you have that mapped out, you're going to want to use some of the more universal copywriting principles. And I'll go back to channeling emotions, right? I tweeted something yesterday or the day before to the effect of, you want to know your market better than they know themselves. You don't want to go only at the stated preference level. You want to go DNA deep. So in a perfect world, so if I'm working with a, you know, that, that hair clinic, well, I, the first thing I would do is look at their testimonials, right? See what are, what did people actually buy, right? You bought hair. The obvious one is you probably bought confidence. Maybe you bought yourself a higher ranking on the Tinder algorithm. Maybe you bought yourself a promotion at work, right? So simple example of what are we really selling, right? You, if you've seen the founder, you know, the history of McDonald's, you know that, um, I can't think of his name, the character played by BJ Novak in the movie. Oh, so I, yeah, I forgot he, his name. <laughs> right. So, so he showed Ray Kroc that McDonald's was in fact in the real estate business. They're not really in the food business during the, during the business of providing a quick, you know, dopamine and caloric surplus in a strategic location, more than specifically being in the culinary arts business. So if you're a small business, ask yourself, what are you actually selling? Go to the deepest, sometimes darkest emotions, you know, things like shame, things like guilt, things like insecurity. Um, you don't necessarily need to call them out directly, but if you know from what place people are, are buying and shopping, you'll do a lot better than saying, you know, if we go back to your hair salon example, um, we're located at this place, $17 cuts. But like what, maybe what, what story does your hair need to tell this month? Right. I just made that up in, in two seconds, but that's probably more interesting. Yeah. And it's, it's really funny because I, I speak to a lot of people and I see this on Twitter too, where they're like, Oh, I, I understand these principles and like, yeah, I definitely see how they work, but they, they never work on me that people, people never want to believe that they're sold on like these testimonials or these ideas that, you know, oh, someone else is using this product, like, or it was mentioned in, in the media. So, you know, I'm more likely to use it. You know, what, what do you think is, is one of the reasonings that happens to where we think we're immune to this, this copywriting, you know, and are people actually immune to the copywriting yeah. or are they just trying to convince themselves they are? So I'll answer that in, in reverse. So I have to say, so now that I've been, I had a corporate career where I did sales and marketing for, uh, for 15 years and I've been self-employed for, for, for actually one year now, uh, a few days back, but I was doing a lot of stuff before. Um, the most adorable thing in the world to me now is advertising doesn't work on me or marketing doesn't work on me. I just, you know, I, I used to laugh or kind of troll people a little bit if I'm being completely candid. Now I just think it's the most adorable thing in the world. Um, every, you know, I think every input 
that comes around you affects you in some way. And, you know, I think one way to think about this is let's say, um, let's, let, let's just say you're very much about local, you know, localism, right? And you see some kind of marketing communication message from Walmart. Well, that, that message did have an impact on you. It pushed you further or validated your worldview to keep going local or go local. So it's not just the direct impact of, of a message, right? It's something is coming inside your brain around your senses and it is doing something to you. And that, that's why I think curating your information diet in this day and age is key, right? Whether it's what mainstream media sources you consume, if any, um, do you block ads or not? Um, the kind of entertainment that you consume, uh, you know, the emotional tone and quality of things, right? Like, it's interesting that one of my favorite professors in undergrad uh, taught a popular culture uh, class. And he said, that was 15 years ago. And he said, you can map uh, recessions with the resurgence of superhero popular media. That was before Disney bought Marvel. So maybe now it'll just be shoved down our throats forever. But I think there's something there, right? So there, there there's, there's always a, a sentiment uh, out there and we're all influenced by it. So I, long answer to a short question, meaning that no one is immune to advertising and copywriting, not even marketers, advertisers, and copywriters. You're, you're not. I think it's adorable if you think you are. So can you talk about whether it's it's a customer you've worked with or a brand you've seen do it really well that have transformed from, you know, they were good and then they implemented really good copywriting and now they're excellent and really just crushing sales? Sure. Um, well, so I'm trying to think of something that your audience would care about, but may, maybe a quick example would be a dental practice. So if you're a general dentist, one of the most profitable activities is to sell ortho. So ortho meaning something like Invisalign, the clear aligning braces or traditional braces. And a lot of these uh, business owners compete on price or they compete on specs. And the minute you shift from that to, again, something as simple as, you know, giving you confident smile, dot, 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 a confident smile, dot, 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 and no one will ever know because the braces are clear, right? Something as, as simple as that versus 24 payments, $100, we're at this corner. Uh, as soon as you start to channel the emotions, you're going to do tremendously better. So that, that's one short example for you. We can find more if you'd like to. No, no, that's, that's, a, that's a really good example. Why, why do you think people are afraid to make that shift? We, we talk about price versus, versus emotional emotional connections with the product. Right. And a lot of folks, you know, and maybe this is an American thing, and I, I know you live in Canada, seem to attempt to compete on price opposed to, you know, trying to compete with a better product or at least that allure of a better product. Why, why do you think that is? Why do you think people are afraid to, you know, make that change with their with their product marketing? So I have two, two hypotheses there for, for product marketing kind of gone wrong. The first one is when you've been living, breathing, dreaming about your product, you are, you know, bathing in its jargon and you're thinking of your competition a lot more than your clients or customers are thinking about the competition. So if you have any kind of price advantage, you know, you're going to want to put that up front. Oh, we're better and we're cheaper, right? Very simple. That would be one thing. The other thing would be there is likely a gap in terms of, you know, the jargon words would be either your customer avatar or your buyer personas, right? Sometimes people say, okay, I'm launching an app, Ari. It's going to be on the Apple App Store. It's a gaming app. So my avatar is young men, 16 to 22, end of research, right? I think so many people will just do a demographic one pager. When I want to sell anything to anyone, I become a creep. I will go on every Facebook group I can find. I will go on every Reddit, subreddit, which I, I only go on Reddit for, for research purposes. 
Um, I'll ask my friends and family. Uh, I will be. I will mystery shop uh, the competition. If if it's a bigger product with a discovery call, I will go on discovery calls. I will do in person or phone interviews with people that have bought. Like let let's just say for my for my coaching program. So we already had an existing audience. So we did fifty free coaching sessions to better discover our customer avatar. Then I went on somewhat similar programs and looked at testimonials. I looked for full names. And then I went and crept on those people's Facebooks and Instagrams. I, I tried to really, you know, in a perfect world, you're building something for yourself, right? In the startup world, you, you, you often hear that. Um, in my two current income streams, I am not the customer avatar. So I have to work extra hard to live in their shoes. And it, I don't want to sound arrogant here, right? But to try and get to know them better than they know themselves. And I'll repeat something I said before. There's a very big difference between stated desires and preferences and actual stated uh, or actual preferences and desires. There's a massive one, right? And um, if I ask you to answer a question now, you'll give me honesty level seven. If I get your Google search history, I'll get honesty level 10. So same deal. And it's, it, it, it's funny, the the way you know you you describe that with well one the the asking me versus versus what what your google google search intent is um but uh you know one of the things that i i i really thought was interesting that you just described is sort of how you're not the customer and a lot of marketers get caught up with this concept that you know they 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 write this copy and they and they think it's for themselves how do you get out of that mindset of I need to write for that that hero journey, that hero persona that that you're describing, that target customer? How how do you shift into that mindset? I, I think I mean you you can only call yourself. Let, let let me take one step back. So if you actually are building something or working for something where you are a, you know, like for for example, if you told me write copy for the new MacBook, I just bought the new 16 inch MacBook. It's it's in the mail. So. I'm, I am the exact avatar, right? So I can just go and do that. But the reality is, unless you're a founder or co-founder marketer, that probably won't be what your career looks like. There's, you know, I think just like anything else in, in the professional world, right? If you're an accountant, you're not going to be doing taxes the same way for everyone and you don't have the same individual situation as all your clients. So as a marketer, I mean, it's an exercise of research of compassion, of empathy, and um, to a degree of voyeurism. The very cool thing about being a marketer and a copywriter, one thing I've, I've had a recent mind sh uh, mindset shift about is every input of pop culture can be considered work, whether it becomes a tweet. So I tweeted something like this, right? An episode of, of Ozark can be market research and become a tweet. And um, it can be a plot point in an email I'm writing on behalf of a client. If I go to Walmart and look at what they have, you know, in their aisles, if I read the National Enquirer, which I do, by the way, uh, amazing source of, of headlines. And I don't really get it very deep into celebrity gossip, but you know what? Um, in, um, in my coaching business, one of the most powerful emails I wrote was about the TV, the TV show, The Biggest Loser. So I really went deep into the psychology of getting on that show, what happens, why it's not the right way to move, why you don't need to work that hard to get good results. And that crushed. That, that, that's, that's so funny that you read the National Enquirer. <laughs> I love that. That's like a, a great inspiration. And in also talking about, you know, what, what The Biggest Loser, I, you know, I, I think a lot of people miss those uh, opportunities where, you know, they, they, they don't think of everyday items as, as inspiration for, for their writing. Um, you know, as, as we begin to wrap things up, you know, the question that I always like to, to ask people at the end is, you know, what is, what is one lesson, you know, what is one thing you do differently? So, you know, you started uh, on your own a year ago, you know, what is one thing you would have done differently with on the copywriting side that, that you've learned now that you would have applied a year ago? I would have, I would have paid 
to get coached by the best earlier. So I, I did it a year later than, basically I did it a year later than would have been optimal in my case. Uh, I think if you want to get into copywriting or marketing, um, any anything relating to online business, right? Don't don't just decide on Saturday and on Sunday give someone five or ten thousand dollars. Take take a couple of weeks to figure out what you want to do. Um, but you know, don't don't get stuck in the procrastination disguised as learning loop, right? So let's talk copywriting specifically. Maybe that's something your audience hasn't uh, thought about or is interested in. So pick one book, right? Not three, not five, not ten. The one I recommend the most for, for new people is called Great Leads by Mark Ford and Michael Masterson. You can get that on Kindle or you can get it directly from the publisher. The used copy is like $1,000 on Amazon, so don't, don't buy that. The publisher is A-W-A-I, uh, A-W-A-I, and the book is Great Leads. So pick up that one book, read that book, practice what you're doing. You can go on a platform called swiped.co, so S-W-I-P-E-D.co to look at ads and then start writing and rewriting other people's sales messages. And then if you decide that this is the right thing for you, then strongly consider getting an actual coach. There's a bunch of permutations. It could be a one-on-one -on -one coach, it could be a group coaching program. Maybe it's a more information product thing with less one-on-one -on -one support, but, you know, accelerating your learning. So sometimes I think, Ari, people have this, uh, this bias against buying information products online. The same, you know, and, and it's a cliche statement at this point, but the same person has no problem doing a four year opportunity cost, paying 20 grand per year to go to do a humanities degree, which I have a lot of respect for. I think general culture is, is important, uh, but they have no problem essentially sinking a hundred K and four years, but they balk at paying maybe two or three thousand dollars for coaching that is directly applicable to the business situation that they want to be in. So don't be afraid to invest in mentorship and coaches. That is the short answer. To yeah, you. that's a, a really in, like that answer and appreciate the book recommendation. I'm gonna personally check it out. So, um, you know, where can folks who want to follow you or, or potentially work with you or, or buy your products, where can they find you? So the best place to find me is on Twitter. Uh, I think Ari will probably drop the the name there. Uh, so first name is Oliver with an extra I. So O L I V I E R C A N T I N. Um, I only tweet about six hundred times per day, so don't worry. I won't keep your feed too much. <laughs> yeah, I'll drop I'll drop the the social links on on iTunes and on uh, uh, YouTube. But but Oliver, thanks again so much for joining me. Really appreciate it. And until next time, everyone. My pleasure, Ari. Thank you.